Let us trust in him today. Because blessing and honor and power and glory belong to him. Amen. Amen. Behold the way, the truth, and the life. Perfect Savior, the blood that washed us white. The God who was and is and shall be evermore. Amen. Can we say amen to that? Amen. Amen. So we're going to just sing the song that says amen. So just sing along with us if you want to. But it's a great hymn, a great song. Amen.
Walt, choir and orchestra, uh, and Robert for leading us into worship this morning. I feel like I came to church and had church. And I gather by the expressions on your face and the evidence of your uplifted hands that you feel like you've come to church as well. Teach us your word this morning, Father. Help us to understand that you have more for us to experience than we are experiencing. In a moment like today, it may be hard for us to realize that you have even greater worship experiences, greater life experiences, greater healing experiences, greater victory experiences than we've ever experienced before. Open our eyes to the possibilities and the potential of being a Christ follower. Not afar, but close up. In Christ's name, amen. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, you need to hear what the, the word of God says today. And then turn to the other person and says, I need to hear what the word of God has to say today. Now I'm praying that your prayer will be answered, that you will experience what God is really saying. So if you have your Bibles, turn to uh, Isaiah chapter 43. I'm gonna read verses 18 and 19, but I need to give you a little background briefly on the whole context. Sometimes when we get into the Old Testament, we're so unfamiliar with the stories that we uh, don't pick up the context rather rapidly. In verses 14, 15, 16, and 17, in these short verses, uh, there are some glorious titles of God. For example, the, the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Wouldn't it be wonderful if uh, some historian said about uh, America that, uh, that uh, God is the sustainer and the King of America in terms of leadership? Or to put it in context today, that uh, the Lord God is the President of the United States. Now, I don't want to get political, but I know some of you believe that the guy that is president sits right close to God. And some of you think he's far away from God. So either one, you can pray for President Trump, whatever your political orientation is. But let me just remind you that uh, whatever our political orientation is presently or in the future, God is God of the United States and of the world. We may or may not acknowledge him. Although we do say on our money that in God we trust, we may or may not really experience that. But I say that God has more for us to experience as a country than we've ever experienced before. God has more for us to experience as a church than we've ever experienced before. Because here in these uh, few verses that I will read to you, it is in view of Israel's prophesied deliverance from Babylon. But also more than that, it is also keeping in mind the ultimate deliverance brought by the Messiah. So if you look at uh, the cross, on the one side, the Old Testament is looking toward the cross. If you're in the New Testament, you're on the other side of the cross looking back of what God has done. The Israelites looked forward to what would happen. And now we look back that of what has happened and the power and the purpose of the cross has brought to us experiences that 
we could never have had before by the law, but by grace. And some of us are living far below our privileges. Let me say that again. Some of us are living well below our privileges. Again, turn to your neighbor and say, you're living below your privilege. Now, some of you are not believing that. I'm going to back up. I want you to understand this. I know some of you ladies are trying to convince your husband that we are living below our privileges. So lighten up with the checkbook and the money and the credit card. So let me back up and say again, turn to your neighbor and say, you're living below your privileges. Well, there's one couple I haven't got to say anything yet. I'm going to linger there until God intervenes and brings healing to this relationship. Stand, if you would, as we read the scripture. Isaiah chapter 43, 18 and 19. It's on the screen if you don't have a, a Bible or if you, you don't have a smartphone or an electronic Bible. Forget the things that happened in the past. Do not keep on thinking about them. I am about to do something new. Let's stop there and say something new. It is beginning to happen even now. Let's say that again. It is beginning to happen even now. So don't you see it coming? I'm going to make a way for you to go through the desert. I will make streams of water in the city and empty in, in the dry and empty land. Let me say that again. I'm going to make a way for you to go through the desert. I will make streams of water in the dry and empty land. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. There's a restaurant that I like to go to not far from here. I like to go to a lot of restaurants. I have evidence before you that I like to eat. Uh, on, the, on the table it says, life is short. You know the rest, don't you? Eat pie first. If you haven't been there, you ought to try that because the pie is very good. And if you do eat pie first, it makes everything else not taste so good. But I like that philosophy. I think God wants us to eat the pie first because more is to come. Many uh, Christians in our world today live on a consumer basis. And in all honesty, I think all of us to a point live as consumer Christians. We like to go to a uh, buffet. There's two reasons why you like to go to a buffet. One, you can eat all you want. Some places say you can only stay here two hours. <laughs> One place narrowed it down to 45 minutes that I went to. But we like to go to a buffet because we what? Can pick and choose what we want. Many Christians are trying to live at a buffet. They pick and choose what they want. What feels good? What sounds good? What's acceptable to my philosophy and lifestyle? Now, as growing up, I did not like green peas. I don't think I was unusual. And my mother would usually say, just try a spoonful. In my own in mature way, I could imagine and I could really fake a gag <laughs> over green peas. As I recall, when I first got married, my wife did not know how to cook very well. Bless her soul. She rests in peace now. Uh, but uh, she wanted to know if I liked green pea soup.
I just have all sorts of imaginations of where that green pea soup came from or what it looks like. I still don't like green peas. But confidentially, I will eat some because they say they're good for me. And there's a lot of things that I don't like to eat that I try to get around to eating because I'm told they are good for me. And there's some things that God has for you to experience that maybe is a little tough for your palate, but you need to eat it anyway. And that's why we go to the Word of God. You don't read the Word of God very long until you get convicted of something. And the Holy Spirit only makes you uncomfortable because he wants to help you to correct something. I hate to go to doctors. I particularly don't like when they give me an injection. And even when I give blood and I, you know, at my age, they think they need to check my blood every 60 to 90 days. I usually say something like this, well, nothing's changed, doctor, so why do you need more blood? because I don't know what has changed. He is trying to find out. But I usually say something like this when they get ready to give me an injection, is this gonna hurt? I don't like to see blood, so I usually turn my head. Now you can imagine not much blood comes out of a, an injection point. But you know, I, I go to the doctor, I listen to him, and I try 90% of the time to take his advice until he gets ready to, as I leave to say, you know, Nathan, it might help your blood pressure if you'd lose a few pounds. And I sort of tune him out there, you know, I've had enough of the doctor, that's all I need, I'll take the medicine, just don't ask me to do too much. I'm sort of painting a picture that is, is a reality in life for many of us, but there is a a spiritual parallel. We, we wait to see who's preaching or what the topic is going to be, whether sometimes we decide we want to go to church, particularly if it's maybe raining or we've had a rough morning. Uh, we say, well, I probably can get along without that. And let the preacher announce he's going to preach on stewardship and we for sure don't find that uh, palatable to our palate. So we live in a, a buffet world spiritually. But I go back to the scripture and I say there's some things that God has said to us that whether we like it or not, we need to listen to the Holy Spirit teach us. And so that's why we pray and ask the Holy Spirit to teach us, to give us knowledge, to give us wisdom. You see, God wants us to change our focus. That's number one. If you're writing, filling in the blanks in your outline, the word is focus. Let us start by changing our focus. Look forward. Uh, the writer here tells us to forget the things that happened in the past. Do not keep on thinking about them, the things that are behind us. You see, someone has said how we view things determines how we do things. Digest that for a moment. How we view things determines how we do things. What you see or focus on is who you will be. When we change the way we see things, the things we look at change. Process that for a moment. When we change the things we see, the things we look at change. If you read the word and understand the word, it changes your thinking. It changes the way you look at things. What you believe about life determines what you perceive about life. And what you receive is what you perceive. If you think there's no hell, you'll live the way you want to live. If you realize that there is a choice between heaven and hell, and you really believe that, 
you'll live differently. You'll live beyond the materialistic side of life all the time. So hurriedly, A, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. If we continue to look behind us, we cannot see where we are going. We cannot depend upon past victories to sustain us. Forget the former things. Yesterday's victories will not sustain you for this day. We cannot allow our past failures to possess us. Do not dwell on the failures of the past. The devil would have you to believe all the bad things about your life and he brings them up. And I've been preaching to you recently that God remembers them, but he chooses not to go there. He's got a file, but he chooses not to go there because of the cross. It's all been blotted out as far as he's concerned. And sometimes we just need to realize that the devil is there to make us feel uncomfortable, to give us a false sense of guilt so we cannot allow our past failures to possess us. Do not dwell on the past failures. We cannot live on yesterday's faith. We must have faith for today. I got up this morning and I thought, it's nice to be alive. Do I have faith for this day? Do I believe good things are gonna happen? And then I jumped ahead and, and beyond the morning and the Sunday and said, well, I know a few things that are gonna happen this week. Do I have faith that I can accomplish those? Or do I have energy and do I have strength to even face those things? You see, God has some experiences for more than what we have experienced. Number two, clarify our focus. Again, the word is focus. Discover what God desires and plans for us. Colossians chapter one, verses 21 and 22. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now Christ has reconciled you. Your physical body is going to escape uh, eternal damnation. You're going to be presented holy in the sight of God without spot or without blemish. No accusations from God. You're covered by the blood of Christ. And so he does not want you to suffer with false guilt. He does not want you to be defeated about wherever you are in life. He has more for you to experience than you are experiencing, my contention is. Paul was writing to the Romans in chapter 8 when he said, uh, Therefore, there is now no condemnation th for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit gives life and has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. You see, God sees yourself, if you're a Christ follower, as redeemed, as set free, as free. And those that he sets free are free indeed. So why are we struggling with strongholds of the past or even strongholds of the present? Because God wants to set us free. Let me say that again. Can I get an amen? God wants to set us free of our strongholds. Amen. So be set free to believe it here, but put it into practice. You say, it's a struggle, I know, but God is there to help you. God sees you as a, a victorious person. And lest I sound a little materialistic, God wants you to be successful in life. Now, some of us have different variations of what successful is, but if you're at peace and there's no condemnation, you're successful. If you have good health, you're successful. If you don't have good health, you're living, you're breathing. God's given us medicine, medicines and medications and doctors and physicians that can enable us to live longer. Some of us may live longer than we want to live. But God has a plan. 
number, it's not, it's under 2B. See your possibilities as God sees them. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image and with everlasting increase. Glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. You see, God has some experiences for you that are beyond what you're experiencing. God has experiences for this church beyond what we're experiencing. As we become more and more a house of prayer, we're going to see more miracles and testimonies, more stones being removed, moved from one to the other. More prayers that are put on the cross answered and deliverance. We'll see more healing. God has a plan. We can't be healed and live forever in the body. We come to a point in life where life as we know it on this earth ceases, but he can give us peace and rest and joy and comfort until then. Got a few amens on that. It's hard to put it into practice sometimes when your bones are aching. But you see, God has possibilities. And finally, third, commit yourself to God's plan. We go back to the, the scripture that we read at the very beginning. Come, let us bow down in worship. Kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are his, the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did at, at Meribah. And so, as you did the day of Massa in the wilderness, don't harden your hearts. Be open to what God has in mind for you. So are you a potpourri kind of Christian? Are you a buffet Christian? Pick and choose in what you want. Are you willing to listen to what God says he desires for your life? God has a plan. I say that over and over, and you've heard it so much. And his plan is good and right. It doesn't always conform to what we desire, but if we pray according to his will, everything turns out all right. You know, some, some doctrinal issues uh, whether we are pre millennialist or post millennialist or whatever, I say I'm a pan millennialist. Live for Jesus Christ and it'll all pan out. If the rapture happens before the tribulation, I'll go. If I go through the tribulation, God will help me make it through. It'll just all pan out. And that's sort of a reflection, I guess, about my Christian walk with God, I believe that if we trust God and are true Christ followers, he's got experiences that we have not experienced before that are good and right, and it'll all pan out. Not always the way I want it, not always on time from my point of view, but in God's time and God's will, because he has a plan. And there's joy and peace when we live in God's plan and he has experiences that are far beyond and far greater than anything that you can imagine. And I know that takes a stretch. So in one way I say, life is short, eat pie first. Eat the word of God first and everything else will turn out okay. Would you stand, please? May every heart be encouraged today to experience more of what you have in mind for them as a Christ follower. May we be encouraged as a church to experience more than what we've experienced in the past as a house of prayer. May we see healings, deliverance, victories, answered prayer, the unusual, the miraculous, 
we don't want to live on just the emotions, but we want to live in reality that you are in charge and this is your world and we are your people by the blood of Jesus Christ. And now may we go in victory and may we pass the peace along by our smile, our testimony, our life. And however we have the opportunity, may we share Jesus. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Sing the doxology if you would. And praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. And now may grace and peace be to you in fullest measure, as Paul said, and we receive that by faith. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and God's people said, Amen. Amen.